Verse 19, and just to give you some background, Absalom, one of David's sons, has just revolted and started a civil war. And they've just had a battle, and 20,000 men have perished. And the Bible says that David is successful. His army is successful. Joab, David's general, ends up killing Absalom, and he ends up dying. And of course, now here comes the hard part. David was not at the battle. If we go back, uh, uh, go and see some other chapters, and David just, he, he didn't want to go into the battle. He didn't want to have to face that opportunity to kill his son, and I don't blame him. I could never imagine even trying to have to, to do something like that. But now Joab is going to send word to David about how the battle went. And he walks up, and, and here's what we see here in verse number 19. It says, Then said Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, Let me now run and bear the king tidings, how that the Lord hath avenged him of his enemies. Now notice, Ahimeaz is excited. Let me run. Let me go. Uh, I imagine Ahimeaz to be young because nobody older wants to run, all right? Let me take a car, a buggy, a mule, something, all right? Let me just not have to run. But here comes Joab, and he said unto him in verse 20, Thou shalt not bear tidings this day, but thou shalt bear tidings another day. But this day thou shalt not bear no tidings, because the king's son is dead. Then said Joab to Cushai, Go tell the king what thou hast seen. And Cushai bowed himself unto Joab and ran. Then said Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok, yet again to Joab, But howsoever let me, I pray thee, also run after Cushai, and Joab said, Wherefore wilt thou run, my son, seeing that thou hast no tidings ready? But howsoever he said he, Let me run. And he said unto him, Run. Then Ahimeaz ran by the way of the plain and overran Cushai. And David sat between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof over the gate under the wall, and lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man running alone. And the watchman cried and told the king, and the king said, If he be alone, there is tidings in his mouth. And he came apace and drew near, and the watchman saw another man running. And the watchman called unto the porter and said, Behold, another man running alone. And the king said, He also bringeth tidings. And the watchman said, Methinketh the running of the foremost is the running of Ahimeaz, the son of Zadok. And the king said, He is a good man and cometh with good tidings. And Ahimeaz called and said unto the king, All is well. And he fell down to the earth upon his face before the king and said, Blessed be the Lord thy God, which hath delivered up the men that lifted up their hand against my lord the king. And the king said, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Ahimeaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant, and me thy servant, I saw a great tumult, but I knew not what it was. And the king said unto him, Turn aside and stand here. And he turned aside and stood still. And Behold, Cushai came, and Cushai said, Tidings, my lord, the king, for the Lord hath avenged thee this day of all them that rose up against thee. And the king said unto Cushai, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Cushai answered, The enemies of my lord the king and all that rise against thee to do thee hurt be as that young man is. And the king was much moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, thus he said, O my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, O Absalom, my son, my son. Lord, we love you and we thank you for tonight. Lord, please just be with our time and I pray that you please just use us in a very special way. Fill us with your spirit and help us to be uh, willing to hear and receive from the word which you would give us. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's a very exciting story. I mean, I get excited when I read things like this because, number one, somebody wanted to do something. This guy, Hemiaz, boy, he wanted to run. Uh, he wanted to be a part. He wanted to do something. It wasn't like, I want to sit on the wayside and just watch. I want to get in the action. Yeah. It's uh, sort of like me when I go to a, a baseball game or a football game or any type of sporting event. Put me in, coach. You're not on the team. Yeah, but I want to play. I mean, just let me go out there and do something. I mean, I'll, um, uh, I'll do something. I don't know what, but just put me in. And uh, sometimes I'll get you in trouble, but I, I just want to be a part. I'm not one of those guys who like to watch. I want to do something. Uh, if there's something to be done at the church, I, I want to be involved. Uh, if that means that I uh, have to find a toothbrush somewhere and just start scrubbing stuff, uh, that's okay. Just let me do it. I want to have some fun and uh, maybe we can enjoy it. And that's a great thing. Well, I love people who have zeal to want to be a part of something. They, they're not afraid. It doesn't matter what. Uh, then we got Cushai. We don't know if he was excited or not because the Bible doesn't really say, but Joab trusted Cushai. And Cushai, the Bible says he ran as well. Now, I think here's this important. When the boss asks you to do something, 
You better do it with some haste, right? Uh, young people, it's sort of like when your mom tells you to go clean your room. It, it means now, not later, not, uh, uh, not when you think about it, because you'll forget. Uh, not when you feel like it, because that'll never happen. But I mean now, go clean your room, go take out the trash, go do something, all right? I'm telling you to do it, and you go do it. And all the children said, uh, all right, but that's just the way it goes. As we look at here, this story, I see two different things I should think about. Number one is the zeal of Ahimeaz. Boy, I never take away the zeal of somebody who wants to do something. They might not have all the right ideas of how to do it. They might not even feel like they know what to do, but I just, I'm excited, so let me do it. It's like a, 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 a somebody who just likes to run. Uh, I remember, uh, this is definitely not me, I was not this type of person, but I used to have some friends when I was a young person, they just liked to run. If they were going somewhere, they were running. Uh, if they were uh, uh, walking slowly, you knew something was wrong. Uh, maybe they hurt themselves or there was something going on, but they just, they ran everywhere. I thought they were weird uh, because who wants to run? I mean, just take your time, but they're just full of life and energy. You know, it's those people, they can't sit still. They got to be doing something, all right? Uh, and thus God invented fidget spinners. All right. And that was that's where it came from. I mean, you just got people who they want something to do and I need to do it just now. All right. Give it to me. That's not a bad thing. And, and, and look at this. When the the watchman saw him, as, what did David say? He's a good man. It, it wasn't negative at all. He's like, all right, that guy's coming. But did you notice what David said? He comes with good tidings. Then Cushai came. Now, I imagine this. I always like to live these stories just a little bit and try to imagine myself as each of these Bible characters. I imagine this. I imagine as Ahimeaz was running and he knew I know the shortcut, the faster way to the king, because that's the reason he wanted to run. He wanted to show off how fast he was. I was telling Vince a story earlier about this 12 year old kid in Marrero, Louisiana a few years ago. He uh, he wanted to race me. And I thought, all right, no 12 year olds ever wanted to race me in my life. And the kid even looked at me and said, I'll give you a five second head start. And he pointed at something that was only like 300 feet away. And I thought, all right, I know I'm in dress shoes. I know I'm in church clothes, but I can beat a 12 year old. All right. This is going to be exciting. So I, I took my suit coat off and I decided, man, I'm going to run. And the kid looked at me and said, I'll give you a five second head start. That should have been my warning sign right there. But I, I, I know, you know how it is. I'm 35 and still can run like a cheetah, I guess. But that was not the case at the moment because I took off running and I thought I was going pretty fast. And I'm not going to exaggerate. In five seconds, I was about halfway there. And this kid didn't cheat. He went one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, and an eternity later there was five. And he took off running, and I'm not kidding you, with 50 feet left to go, he blew by me. I did not know that this kid had a full-time speed training coach and he was training to be in the Olympics. As a matter of fact, uh, our young man uh, here, Mr. Robbie uh, Holly, he goes to his church, this young man does, and uh, he's actually going to be in the Olympics next year. I mean, that's how serious. So I lost to an Olympic athlete. It was so close. I mean, <laughs> I'm thinking about taking uh, some time off next year and putting some time in it. No, I'm just kidding. That was, I was like winded and he looked at me and goes, you want to do it again? And I went, Nah, it's all right, you know. But Ahimeaz, he had all the zeal in the world. But um, Absalom, or excuse me, Joab knew that if I'm going to share the story of what happened to Absalom, Ahimeaz has a reputation of being really happy, wiry, jittery, maybe a little bit. I don't know. That's just me imagining the story. But if I have Ahimeaz go and do it, the king's going to think something good has happened when that's not really the case. Cushai... He knows how to give the bad news, but in a good way. Cushai knows how to give the knowledge of what he's seen. Because look, Joab, we don't see here in the Bible where the Bible says that Joab wrote a note, that Joab said, all right, Cushai, this is what I want you to say. Joab said, Cushai, I want you to go and tell the king what you've seen. Now, Hemiaz, while he's running, and remember, he takes the, sh the shortcut to get to the king faster. I imagine while he's running, he starts to realize something. I'm going to beat Cushai there. 
do I really want to be the one to tell the king that his son died? Do I want to be the one who maybe uh, uh, shares this information? Because maybe that won't be a good thing. Maybe the king gets mad at me. Maybe the king gets upset with me because everybody knew the king had ordered Absalom wasn't supposed to die. But anyway, Ahimeaz ran and he gets there and Ahimeaz knows what had happened. He knew that the king was dead because not only did he say in verse 19, let me tell the king that his enemies have been avenged. Uh, Joab tells him in verse 20, the king's son is dead and you don't get to tell him that. I imagine when he gets there, he realizes I'm not about to tell him what happened. And when he shows up to the king, the king says, all right, now you brought me tidings. And what is it? Well, your enemies are dead. Well, what about Absalom? Um, there was something going on. There was a tumult, as he said. I mean, king, something was happening and I just wanted to be a part. And the king, in all his graciousness, says, all right. You stand over here. And the Bible says uh, that he stood, turned aside and stood still. Now, I don't know. The father inside of me imagines that there was a corner and his nose was stuck in it. But I, that's not exactly probably what happened. But that's how I imagined it. Why? Because he stood still. You know, all good kids in the corner stand still for 10 seconds. And then the, next, uh, the rest of life goes on. Then Cushai comes up. And Cushai, he... I think, had a few more seconds to think about this, and he knew he had to tell the king what was going on. And he says, King, I, I hate to tell you this, but the enemies, they're dead. All right, Cushai, let me ask you the same question I just asked to him. He has, what about Absalom? And he said, Sir, the enemies are just as that man is. Can you imagine the tears, the difficulty, the pain? But could you imagine just a, I almost want to say it a nicer way to say it. He didn't just show up and say, yo, king, your boy's dead. He said, let me, let me kind of sugarcoat this a little bit. He said, all right, now that you've pulled him my heartstrings, what are you trying to do to me here tonight, Brother Aaron? Well, I want to give you just a few thoughts about this. All of us go through stages of life, and I think the spiritual life you can see right here in this passage of Scripture. I think, number one, you see Ahimeaz, and people know him. He's a good young man. People respect him. People admire him, and he has the zeal. I just want to do something. You remember what it was like. You first got saved. You first got into church, and man, if the pastor says, hey, I need someone... Well, okay, can I tell you what it is first before you raise your hand and volunteer? No, I'll do it, Pastor. Just sign me up. I want to be involved and I want to be a part. Now, I'm not saying Kujai was a bad guy, but Kujai had some experience. He had some wisdom and some knowledge. And when he was told to do something, he didn't reject it. He didn't push it away. He had knowledge. Though. He had wisdom. I think what I see here is I see a balance between the Christian life and Two things that I think God wants all of us to have in our life is number one, zeal. So often we lose that zeal. We lose that fire, that fervent spirit. We lose that, I've got to do something right now. And why do we lose that? Well, we lose that because we get complacent. Well, I've been there. I've uh, seen, the, uh, uh, seen the touristy spot. I bought the shirt, the cup, the clippers, the, the coffee mug, uh, whatever else you get when you go to the touristy places. Uh, I grew up in Florida, really close to Daytona Beach and Orlando. Uh, I don't think I have anything touristy there, but everybody else does because they come down there and get it. But that's kind of the idea. You go somewhere touristy, you want it because when you're there, it's like, this is exciting. I mean, I've never done this before and I, I, I'm getting to enjoy it and experience it. You know, as a Christian, maybe you've been saved for a long time. And boy, that zeal, maybe it's just not as much as it used to be. And the pastor's like, man, I need people too. And you're like, yeah, maybe next week. I'll go to the prayer meeting next week, pastor. I promise. I just, I've been really tired. Well, yeah, that, I, that happens. And all right, well, I look forward to seeing you next week. Some of us, we, uh, that zeal's just gone. 
David, I think, gives it great to us in the book of Psalms when he says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. But do we really need that to be restored? Can I ask you a question? When was the last time you just said, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul? He said, well, I, I do it all the time, but stop and really think about it. Do we really? Do we really put the time and effort into saying, Lord, I want to thank you today? And you say, well, how can I? I mean, I can say it, yes, but if it was to be shown in an action, I mean, did we live today like we were thanking the Lord for saving my soul? And boy, sometimes it's, uh, we get busy with life and we lose that zeal to want to keep the important things important. I don't want to lose that zeal. Life is way too short. There's too many things to do. As I continue to read and study, I mean, the world's population is just exploding. In my lifetime, I was born in 1986, and all the kids just went, whoa. That was like last century. Yeah, it's not that long ago, okay? All right, I promise. Uh, you'll be like that one day too, all right? But anyway, uh, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, and some of you are like, uh, man, you're just a whippersnapper. I know, I apologize. I didn't mean to make anybody feel older than they aren't, all right? But I just appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate the fact that, you know, as I, I think about that, I mean, you, 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 there's a lot more people on this earth. Yeah. If, I, if I read correctly, there was five and a half billion people when I was born. There's eight billion people alive today. There is a need for people to get a zeal and a fervor in their spirit to go out and do something. And boy, can I commend you, Gospel Light Baptist Church. Last time I was here four years ago, your pastor talked about starting churches, talking about growing and building and multiplying. I'm here again, and he's still talking about growing and building and multiplying. Are you still with him? Oh, yeah. uh, well, I helped with the last one. No, come on now, folks. There is a zeal. We need to continue and we need to go and go and go because this world shall soon end. And when it'll be, I don't know. But I don't want to stand before God one day and say, well, I had more important things to do. No, Lord, I put my passion, I put everything I had into it, every moment of every day. Yes, I was working, but while I was working, I was praying. I was thinking, how can I help? What can I give? How can I benefit? I, as a teacher, uh, I've heard all the excuses throughout the years. And my favorite was, oh, I just didn't have time. My favorite question to ask a junior high student when they say I didn't have time, how much TV did you watch this week? Well, that, don't talk about that, preacher. I, I mean, I, it's important. I got to watch my show. Yeah, but the average American spends anywhere from four to six hours a day watching some form of visual media. That's a lot of time. If we just put, look at this, I'll ask for what God asked for, just 10% of that time into something that God wants. Could you imagine how much more could be done for the calling of Christ if we just gave God a tithe of that? Boy, it'd be amazing. And you know what it'll do for you? It'll get you excited. You know, when I go so winning, sometimes I'm not excited especially when I'm in the South and my car says it's 108, all right? But I mean, I really don't feel like going so on and at that moment. But you know what happens when I get out there and I pass out that first track? And then I pass out that second track and then someone stops and lets me talk with them through the track. And maybe they don't get saved, but it just gets me excited. There's still people out there that want to hear what I have to say. Am I willing to go out there and still have that zeal to go do it? And I'm not just talking about getting people saved, whatever it is in your life that you do for Christ, because not everybody can go. I get to work with the senior citizens of our church at First Baptist of Hammond. Some of them, they, they can't go soul winning like that. It's just not possible. But they can continue to help at the church and help cook a meal or help do something. They can pick up a phone and make a phone call. They go with a zeal and a fervent. And I must hasten, I'll finish quickly with this. That second one is knowledge. You know, sometimes we get to the point in our life where we just feel like I have arrived. I know everything there is to know, especially if you're between the ages of 14 and 16. It just seems to be magnified. All right. Uh, I remember the, the moment in my life when I remember thinking, I know more than my mom. And I proceeded to tell her how much I thought I knew more than she did. I don't have to finish that story, I don't think. All right. But the idea of. I just know it all. 
And then my mom answered some question that I had no idea about. And I was like, oh, okay, all right. But anyway, we never should stop learning. You know, the, the pastor mentions discipleship and, and just a little parenthesis. Pastor didn't give me notes to preach from tonight. All right. I, this was something I'd been on my heart and mind. But he mentioned discipleship. You know, we started that at First Baptist Church of Hammond about nine years ago, something we'd never done before. And boy, let me tell you, it, it's been life changing, not just for the people, but for me. I mean, to go from the idea of, uh, you know, I know some stuff, but that I could share it with other people. And sometimes we think, well, well, who should go through discipleship? Everybody. Amen. Well, I've been saved for, yeah, it doesn't matter. See, let me tell you something about discipleship. It isn't just for you. See, discipleship is about being able to spend time with someone else and watch that light bulb turn on in their eyes. You know what that kind of knowledge transformation does? It gets you zeal and excitement again. Can I encourage you today? If you ever feel like you've come to the place where I can't learn anything else, well, then you've got a problem. I would guess to say that the zeal has left because there's no desire to continue to grow that knowledge. And I, I understand, and again, sometimes life difficulties, you know, you're, uh, as our dear lady back here with the, uh, with the broke leg, she told me she was trying to save children out of a burning building. I mean, if, you know, she was very zeal oriented there for the Lord, but as you understand, sometimes you know, she can't exactly go soul winning right now. But you know what? That fire is there. That zeal is there to want to do it. But sometimes there are circumstances like that. But hey, this is a time to grow other areas of your Christian life. Can I encourage you? God will put you where he wants you to be. He'll give you the ability. You understand this. God will give you the pastor that he wants you to have because he's trying to train you and give you abilities that you need that are very specific to you. Ahimeaz in this moment couldn't do what Cushai could do. But you know, there was a time, obviously, that Cushai could not do something that Ahimeaz could do. Because Ahimeaz had a reputation. Good man. Boy, I can't wait to hear what he has to say. Here comes Cushai. And when Ahimeaz was standing still in the corner, <laughs> Cushai talked. Ahimeaz didn't say, well, I could have told you, or oh, I should have said. He understood in that moment, hey, this is Cushai's time. He didn't get jealous that, oh, pfft, I couldn't do what Cushai could do. I mean, goodness, I could tell uh, the king that his son had died. I mean, I could have told him he was dead. But that wasn't the time or place. I bring it all back to this final thought. God gives all of us the gifts and talents and abilities we have. It's our responsibility to keep the zeal and the fervor and the spirit. It's our job to continue to learn and grow in knowledge and in grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. But understand this. It doesn't matter what God calls us to do. God calls all of us to do something. And I shouldn't get jealous when God magnifies somebody else at a certain time and not me. Because here's what I understand my time will come eventually as well. God uses everybody at a different time because God understands that not everyone is the same. And praise the Lord, we're all a little bit different and not the same. And God gives us that variety and spice of life. But it brings me to this realization, I shouldn't get upset when God magnifies somebody over me when I feel like, boy, I've got zeal, I've got knowledge, I'm doing everything I can. God just says, not right now. Your time will come though. And it leads me to that final thought is don't get jealous when God brings somebody and magnifies them over you. God knows what the person or the time or whatever the case may be. God has a plan. I end with a story to kind of illustrate that. I remember when I was a young person, my parents were very much. Uh, we're very much into soul winning. And I remember when I was six years old, uh, my mom was uh, uh, out visiting and I wanted to tell people about Jesus. And my mom just said, oh, not yet. I got eight years old and I had gone through some soul winning programs and I was all excited. I'm going to tell someone about Jesus. And I remember we were in, uh, uh, in a, a little bit of a rough area there in Florida and visiting someone. My mom was making a visiting and as she was making a visit, her son walked out. And boy, I was able to take a Bible and, and show him the Romans road. And, and uh, he, he prayed the prayer and I showed him all the verses. 
And boy, it got me excited about soul winning. And I started sharing the gospel with as many people as I could. And I remember maybe two, three years later, I, I shared the gospel with this man. And uh, to be honest, I don't remember his name right now. But for this, for this story, it fits so well. I, I, I had his name in my soul winning New Testament that I had talked to him. And that he had gotten saved. And I was the one that told him. Well, we had a visiting evangelist uh, by the name of Bill Burr who came to our church when I was a young person, he used to travel and sing all over America, and just a wonderful guy. And somehow he met this man while he was in our town and invited him to come to church that night. And when he walked in, I looked at him like, man, that guy looks familiar. And I walked up and I asked him his name and he told me his name. And I'm like, I know you. And I had my soul winning Bible and I pulled it out and I showed him his name. He's like, yeah, that's me. I don't remember you though, kid. And I'm like, I had a lasting impact on this guy's life. But the preacher gets up and preaches. The guy walks the aisle. He gets saved, comes to church. And I remember thinking as a kid, well, I invited that guy to church and he didn't come. I tried to, I mean, I guess I talked with him and I tried to lead him to the Lord. And maybe I didn't do it the way I was supposed to. And I, I remember as a kid, just for a minute, feeling a little devastated, feeling like, boy, you know, uh, uh, the carpet had been pulled out from underneath of me. I remember the, the pastor preaching a sermon, just something like this. You know, God uses you the way he wants you to be used. Don't get jealous when God uses somebody else in a different way that you don't think is right. Because we're all on the same team. We're all trying to pull on the rope the same direction. And it's not very helpful when I'm over there getting mad at other people. Because then when I get mad, what am I not doing? I'm not pulling on the rope. If I'm not pulling on the rope, guess what I'm probably not doing? Probably not building my knowledge. Probably not building my zeal. And it brings me a realization. Just because somebody else down the road might be doing something and it seems like God's blessing their church, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Hey, maybe so-and-so, uh, they, they did a better job than me. Well, maybe you'll do a better job next time. It doesn't mean it's the end of the world and nobody hates you or doesn't like you. It means that that's how that situation ended. Can I encourage you today, as we see from this story, there's two things I can learn from it. Am I making sure I still have zeal to want to do something? Am I making sure that I'm growing the knowledge that I have? Well, I think those are two powerful truths that God could use for us.